ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another thing where I talk about things today, once again, in the suit, because I have another commission. Uh, somebody sent me a commission to talk about, actually, uh, marijuana and the ongoing stuff dealing with that, the legal stuff, and the health stuff, because it's starting to be legalized in more places, and uh, as people begin to make money from it, they start to send money to the government, and the government says, oh, why money? Maybe we should consider making this legal, uh, because that's how a government works in the States. Um, but anyway, though, so some, someone was wondering, they were just curious about uh, about the drug and if I could shine some light onto what it actually does and whether or not it's dangerous or whether or not uh, it's perfectly safe or whether it's helpful or harm, this sort of thing. And uh, and I've got to say, starting off for this, uh, this video, whatever you know about marijuana, unless you have... Uh, a good familiar, a good familiarity with the uh, scientific stuff, and you know, uh, to always continue asking questions. Basically, just forget everything that you know about marijuana, because the truth is, we know very little about the drug uh, in terms of what it does over the long term. We don't even really know, like, we know farming techniques for the drug, and we know, like, for example, uh, people who farm the drug know how to make a very strong marijuana plant. But when you get into stuff like regulatory things and looking at like how much energy and resources does it really take to farm marijuana plants, that's something that we're still kind of learning. There's, there's debate. If some people, for example, believe that marijuana plants take just ridiculous amounts of water and energy, and energy to produce, and the only reason why people do it is because uh, the drugs are very pop, uh, they're, they're uh, profitable very profitable they're worth a lot of money uh, but then other people argue that no really I mean it doesn't take that much water and energy it's just that uh, a lot of people like a lot of growers are sort of um, you could say they're they're not like uh, they're not very efficient and so they sort of like they'll divert streams and they don't really do them in a way that has conservation in mind so it's really not that the drugs uh, take a ton of water and energy it's that they are uh, being farmed really inefficiently so we've got this going on as we kind of look at the legal farms that are coming up there's a lot of restrictions and they they don't know for sure where it's all going to go with that um, they do think, however, that the further it's, once it becomes legal enough that banks are comfortable with accepting money for uh, marijuana growth and stuff like that, that probably some big oligarch is going to come in, somebody like Monsanto or Marlboro or whatever, is going to swoop in and just start to buy up all the crops, and, and pretty soon it's going to stop being, uh, uh, it's not going to be like a little guy out in the field thing anymore, it's going to be a great big corporate deal. So that is that is where we believe the bottom line is going to be is that sooner or later the uh, the smiling tigers that run the country will pretty much take it over, but uh, but that's that's life. Um, but more importantly, though, the the bigger question has been really about health and kind of like what will happen. I mean, imagine that you started to see more widespread marijuana use. Like suppose that uh, more people started taking it, and some people I like I've seen so much propaganda both for and against marijuana. And uh, almost all of it is lies, I found out. Like, I started looking into stuff. And uh, so I've got to, like, debunk a lot of stuff when I start talking about this. Um, uh, for, for one thing, there aren't really that many marijuana smokers. Uh, uh, older folks, for some reason, they, they want to believe... Uh, I know that some of them want to believe that my generation, the younger generation, is smoking all kinds of pot. Uh, like, we're just we're record levels of pot smokers. And I, I believe it's true we have an elevated incidence of smoking pot. Uh, some people have pointed towards the D.A.R.E. programs, and this is kind of amusing, is the D.A.R.E. programs would show up and they would uh, they would have these, like, the cool kids would be smoking marijuana, and you'd have, like, the main character, he'd, and he'd show up and he'd be like, oh, hey, cool kids, you guys are smoking marijuana, huh? And they'd be like, yeah, you want to smoke marijuana? And then a man in a silly wizard hat would show up and he'd be like, stop! You don't have to be cool, you can be lame and still be cool in your heart. And, uh, and kids didn't buy that, they wanted to be cool. So the D.A.R.E. program sort of backfired, some people believe. Uh, it's, it would be hard to prove that exactly, but uh, but they do notice like they had the D.A.R.E. program and then the generation they applied the D.A.R.E. program to has had a higher incidence of uh, pot smoking. But you also have to think that there's been uh, demographic shifts in where the pot is coming from. Um, I believe that it's, it's becoming more and more locally grown and so it's getting easier to get a hold of and and stuff like that. So there's there's perhaps a couple of reasons why you might see a higher incidence of, of uh, pot smoking in the U.S. But uh, really, um, from in terms of general population percentage, it's really not like it's not that high. It's not like everybody in a generation is doing. It was something like I think they estimated like 15% of people uh, smoke with any kind of regularity, something like that. So it would be like one in one in 
I mean, like 1.5 and 10, I guess, uh, to, to really not give a nice round number. Didn't give a nice round number. 3 and 20, I suppose, would be more round. Uh, but not as, not like, not like, you could say it's not that really, not that common. Um, but be that as it may, though, the thing that's really interesting is that the drug has been, it's Schedule 1, which means that they, they have declared that it has no medicinal value. Um, and it does have medicinal value. It's like really limited medicinal value. But it's Schedule 1, so it's really highly regulated. It's very hard to get a hold of it. It's very hard to do anything with. And for the longest time, we have only had like one group with the legal authority to research a drug like marijuana. And the trouble is, is that this research group didn't, uh, they, they haven't really known how to grow very potent marijuana. And so as they do their studies, they go through all kinds of red tape and there's like a lot of stuff that they're like, we want to try this. And then like the DEA gets involved and like the, uh, the uh, you know, like the, uh, I think the FDA maybe too. I was just reading about like, there's like two or three regulatory agencies that show up every time this group tries to do a new line of research. And then they either like approve it or they don't approve it. And if any one group gets upset, it doesn't get approved. So uh, there's even just starting research on marijuana is virtually impossible. It just gets to be ridiculous. It's only in recent years as we've started to legalize the, the drug in like Colorado and like regions of California, stuff like that, uh, that we've, we've started to get to where we can actually go to like those places and then have the drug and then be like, okay, let's try something and see what happens and see what it does. So we know the method of action for marijuana, but we don't, what we don't have are longitudinal studies. And longitudinal studies are where you get someone and you're like, okay, so you smoke pot for 20 years and we're going to come back and see how you're doing. And, uh, and cause there would be, I mean, like, can, you know, you can imagine like, we'll pay you, well, you know, we'll pay you to, to smoke pot for 20 years. Um, there would be people who would do that, but it's, it's like presently it's completely illegal to offer that kind of study. So we've never had a longitudinal study where we could make someone, we, we could have people smoke pot for 20 years and then come back and see whether or not their health has been impacted. Uh, so they don't know if there are any long-term health drawbacks or, I mean, if there were benefits, they wouldn't be able to tell that either because there's no way to watch somebody over that very long span of time. Uh, they do know that there are, uh, there are effects, and this is how you should think about this. Don't, don't think of marijuana as like uh, a pure evil or like a, or like a good, it's like, it's like, oh, it's an herb, it's good for you. Don't think of it in those terms. Think of it as just, it's a drug and it has effects on your physiology. So it has effects, it has, it has plenty of short-term effects. Um, but we don't, we don't know what the long-term effects are. Uh, like I say, it's interesting because the, the only, there's only one group in the U.S. that can do research on this, and they, they haven't even really known how to grow like marijuana because it's so, just so heavily regulated, it's very illegal. And so they didn't grow very strong marijuana. They had a really hard time testing stuff. Um, and also, too, a lot of their test subjects, as they look at people, they would find out that their test subjects were also, like, doing cocaine and, like, uh, smoking cigarettes. And so they'd say, like, well, there's a higher incidence of uh, cancer, but all of our patients were also smoking cigarettes, so we have no freaking clue. Um, but anyway, though, one we can still speculate and make some hypotheses based on, uh, on things that, that marijuana does. I will say before I get into this, um, there have been proven some positive medical effects of smoking marijuana, um, positive depending on uh, who you are and what's going on in your life. For example, uh, it can increase your appetite. Uh, this is something that we all know about the munchies. Um, when you when you take when you smoke marijuana, it increases your appetite. Uh, it also decreases nausea, and uh, and there's a reason for this, a medical reason, which I will get into. Um, but they they uh, do use a synthetic form of T, uh, THC now, THC being the core component of marijuana, and they give this to to say like chemotherapy patients. Because as they're on chemo, they, they become very nauseous, they vomit a lot, and they can't keep down food, they can't eat, they lose weight, and that's not good. So now they give them a, uh, a drug, I believe it's called dronabinol, uh, if I'm pronouncing it right, it's one of those, uh, uh, something, something like dronabinol. It's like a synthetic form of THC. And if you take that, then, uh, then if you like take it for like a few days, then for those few days, you will have increased appetite, reduced nausea, and, uh, and you can maybe keep some food down while you're on your chemo. So it's a useful drug for that sort of thing. Uh, uh, kind, of, kind of funny though, because that was one of those way back, I remember like a couple of years ago, they were really pushing the whole medical marijuana thing. They were like, oh, we really need more marijuana because it's, you know, it's medical. And then they produced synthetic like THC. And it was like, oh, 
Yeah, well, glad you listened to us, but really we <laughs> we just sort of wanted pot. Um, yeah. So so anyway though, but uh, drawn and beanol actually it turns out that they're those those effects things like increased appetite and and whatnot. If you take the drug consistently over long spans of time, then actually those effects your body develops an immunity to oftentimes. So it, it's not a very effective like long-term drug if you're on if you're going to be on chemo for like months and months and months. It's something that you take Dronabil for a little while right after you're taking your chemo and then you know like you, you don't want to take it uh, consistently because you'll lose the positive effects. Um, yes, uh, that's that said, uh, people do build up tolerances to marijuana. This is one thing is that people who smoke a lot of marijuana they find that you actually do need uh, you do need stronger forms of the stuff if you get to be if you get to develop too much of a resistance to it, um, they they have different ways of making marijuana to make it stronger. There's uh, there's for example there's injectable marijuana. Some of you guys may not be aware of that. Um, and, and they say things like uh, they say like marijuana can't kill you, and you can actually you could kill yourself with marijuana. It is possible to uh, take so much THC that you will you will die. But uh, it's kind of like saying you know you could die from caffeine. You could take a whole ton of caffeine and it would kill you. Uh, but uh, it's it's not something that commonly happens to people. Um, there's not really any recorded cases of death from marijuana overdose, from THC overdose. But they have proven that, yeah, you can absolutely kill, like, animals. They've killed lab animals using marijuana. And the most likely way that you would die is if you were directly injecting marijuana, in, er, uh, uh, cannabis oil, actually. If you're directly injecting cannabis oil into your bloodstream, uh, that would be the most likely way that you're going to die because that's the most concentrated dose of uh, THC that you can get. But you would still have to be reject injecting a ridiculous amount of uh, marijuana into your system. I think that what they said it was is like 30 milligrams per kilogram of person is how much you would have to inject. And uh, and basically, yeah, it's it's a ton. It's one of those things. Like I say, you could you could kill yourself with caffeine. I have enough caffeine hit sitting around my house that I could seriously kill myself with it. If I just like swallowed a whole bottle of caffeine all at once, I would be dreadfully dreadfully sorry. Uh, you could do that same thing with marijuana. If you had like a whole ton of marijuana, you could uh, you could uh, kill yourself with it. So it can be fatal. It's not it's not like uh, you know. I mean, like anything in excess is bad. Uh, you can overdose though. It's actually very easy to overdose. Just like with caffeine. Like if you take two pills, two caffeine pills on an empty stomach, then you get really jittery and nervous and maybe a little bit nauseous. Same thing goes with marijuana. If you if you were to smoke too much and you hadn't really like you were a first time smoker or something like that. You could easily make yourself uh, develop all kinds of negative, like you just make yourself feel really unpleasant. So uh, overdosing on marijuana is a possibility. It's something, again, just because it's a natural herb doesn't mean that it's something perfect for you. Um, but what marijuana actually does, uh, the way that it activates things, is it's a, it's a competitive inhibitor, actually, is what it does, is it inhibits the production of cyclic AMP, that is a cyclic uh, adenosine monophosphate. Is what that is, and uh, and what camp is camp for short. Uh, camp does is it's a transducer. What it does is it helps your body's cells communicate with each other, because uh, cells all have like cell membranes, and these membranes keep junk out of the cells. Like you don't want uh, you don't want like large pieces of crap to get into your cells. So they have these membranes, and the membranes have little pores, and the pores let in stuff like water and like small things that they can eat, stuff like that. But they don't let in like great big bulky proteins or, or like hormones or things like that. So cyclic AMP, what it does is it actually communicates to the cells for you. Is it will accept those hormones like you know big bulky hormones, and then it goes and it communicates to the cells. It goes, oh, I got this hormone. So guys, we've got this message. Go do, go do this. So it transfers information to cells basically. Uh, what marijuana does is it it uh, inhibits the production of cyclic AMP. So it basically screws up your body's ability to communicate with itself internally. Um, this this is uh, in terms of in terms of something that a drug can do, it may potentially be safer than than some things. Uh, like for example, if you were to abuse testosterone, what testosterone will do um, is it, it's got kind of an interesting effect on the body. When you get a whole bunch of testosterone in your system, your testosterone loop is actually it's designed to shut off when you get testosterone. Like uh, basically. Your en you get these enzymes that produce testosterone, and then testosterone actually has another uh, spot. Um, or I, I'm like a, I'm like uh, making this up off the top of my head, but uh, but basically, 
there's, I mean, like there's a cycle, but basically the way that you can think about it is that uh, once it produces a molecule of testosterone, and then like molecules of testosterone will fit into like a little, a little uh, oh, opening in the enzyme, and when they do, it changes the shape of the enzyme, and the enzyme stops producing testosterone. So it has a self-regulating sort of system involved, where if it produces a bunch of testosterone, then sure enough, testosterone gets stuck in the uh, in the thing that changes the shape of the enzyme. And there you go. So when you oversaturate your body with a ton of testosterone by actually like injecting yourself with testosterone shots, then that oversaturation of testosterone then shuts down all your nor your, all your natural testosterone production, and you wind up basically screwed up because your body is getting all kinds of signals to stop testosterone testosterone production, and it's trying to stop, but it can't. And so if you do this over long stretches of time, your body's natural systems for producing testosterone get functionally train wrecked. Um, what marijuana does, however, is it, it's not really, uh, it's not, it's not stimulating euphoria by, like, injecting stuff into you. Like, it's not like you're directly injecting some kind of, um, uh, like, it's not like you're directly, directly injecting endorphins into your body. It's just preventing this, uh, the production, the synthesis of cyclic AMP. So you wind up with less cyclic AMP in your body. Now, uh, the thing about this is I couldn't tell you I couldn't tell you whether or not because they haven't done any longitudinal studies I couldn't find any any information on what happens when you inhibit the production of cyclic AMP for a stretch of like 20 to 40 years like if you were a chronic smoker and you smoked every single day that would mean that every single day you were inhibiting the production of uh, of cyclic AMP and uh, and that's got to have some kind of effect on your body because it's, it's preventing your hormones from communicating with your body in the way that they normally would. Um, they believe that cyclic AMP also has uh, some, th some interaction with the, frontal, with the frontal lobe of your brain, which is the reasoning center of your brain. That's why you get a little stupid when you smoke pot. Uh, they don't know how it interacts, but that's because the brain is still very much a mystery to us. Uh, they believe that, that basically it, it kind of has a way of closing channels or you know regulating this or that. And, uh, and it causes, because it has a lot to do with communication, it affects the way that your brain communicates with itself. Again, you've got the little cells, they've got their membranes, they need cyclic AMP to help with communication. So, uh, how it generates euphoria, I also didn't see. Uh, there, might be, there might be research on that, but again, the research is all very poor. So, the question that they're trying to figure out presently is is what does happen if you're a chronic smoker of marijuana over a long stretch. Um, they do believe that uh, cyclic AMP also has an impact on cancer rates, is they find that um, it's got something to do because it, because again it regulates cell communication and so like if you have cells that are growing out of control, normally cyclic AMP it provides a certain amount of communication. They have a hypothesis that cyclic AMP is involved in the regulation of cancer cells as well. So they suspect that potentially uh, doing a lot of marijuana might increase your risk of cancer, but they don't know that either. Uh, they don't know that for sure. So, uh, so yes, that's kind of the short of it. That's the so like that's what marijuana does. Uh, it's, it, it inhibits production of cyclic AMP, and uh, and there's no telling for sure what that does over the long term. Um, but like I say, it's, it's probably not as bad for you as something like a direct testosterone injection because, again, it's, it's not really causing your body to go into overdrive and to try and, like, shut down a whole system. What it does is it just kind of slows down and, uh, and impairs a, normal, a system that's normally being produced. Um, although I could be wrong, but you don't, you don't get any, like, really obvious things that go wrong from people as far as we can tell. Nothing in the short term. So, uh, yes, that is that. Um, I was going to say, oh yeah, uh, also there are other side effects of the drug. Like I said, some good or some bad, it just depends on your situation. It can also lower your blood pressure, which, which could be good if you have high blood pressure, or it could be really bad if you're hypotensive. Hypotensive meaning that your blood pressure is already kind of low. Uh, so, decent if you're hypertensive. Not so decent if you're hypotensive. If you're hypotensive, you don't want your blood pressure to go any lower, so you should avoid marijuana. Uh, also, like I say, because cyclic AMP has a lot to do with hormone communication, if you're young, like if you're a teenager, I really would strongly recommend not smoking marijuana. Uh, generally speaking, I wouldn't recommend it anyway, because uh, because uh, it's, it's one of those things where, like, if you were gonna, if you were gonna be, like, really worried about your own health, and you were going to do drugs, you might actually just talk to your doctor and be like, so doctor, um, 
supposing hypothetically I was to do marijuana, like, uh, what would you, like, would you, like, your doctor will probably recommend you don't do it, but, um, but it's like the same thing. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like alcohol. Like you can be like, so suppose I were gonna drink. I mean, could I drink with my current health the way that it is? And your doctor might be able to give you a, give you a yay or nay on that sort of thing. But it's something I would check into. If you're if you're like living in one of the areas where they're starting to legalize marijuana and you're thinking about taking it, you may wanna you may just wanna stay. Like you may just wanna notify some kind of health professional. Maybe go down to the local pharmacy. They might be up on it. Uh, like I say, the drug is very similar to. Uh, THC is very similar to some other stuff that's available now, like dronabinol. They have info on that. They could probably tell you whether or not you are in uh, reasonable health for that sort of thing, or whether or not it's a good idea. Um, like I say, if you have like low blood pressure, you would maybe want to avoid pot. Uh, this or that. There's there's effects. There's effects of the drug. Uh, but don't yes, never never ever get in the mentality that it's all good or all bad. It just does things. And uh, and those things are things, and uh, and that's and that's uh, that's all there is to it. So, yeah, uh, that has been the major hurdle, though, in terms of legalizing pot and where it's becoming legal, is they're starting to legalize it mostly for money reasons. This is the thing that's very frustrating: is if they were really sensible, like if our government were were perfect and acted with sense, then what they would have done is they would have passed laws to make it easy to research marijuana. And then after they had some good studies, they might have then considered releasing laws like to, to actually legalize it. But instead, because our government works the way that it does, um, mostly it's just lobby groups that are getting this stuff passed through. And so, like, if you know you can make a lot of money through pot, then you can pay our politicians to pass the laws to make pot legal, and then it will gradually become more and more legal because there's money behind it. And uh, personally, I don't think that there's going to be any like real long-term. I don't think there's going to be any major damage to this to society or anything like that if they legalize pot. Uh, from what I researched, it looked like if it has any really strong negative health impacts, they're not they're not like drastic. And it's only if you're chronically using it. It's kind of like alcohol, where if like you drink alcohol every day, uh, you would be in significantly worse health. But uh, uh, pot's probably going to be kind of similar. As people say, like pot you know at least at least pots like not as bad as alcohol and uh, and I don't know I couldn't find any any uh, any proof to back that up because uh, pot and marijuana both affect your body in completely different ways so I don't know that pot is really better for you it just it just definitely affects you in ways that are are really strange like I say like this the whole thing that kind of shocked me when I found out I was like oh it suppresses cyclic AMP that's like a really important thing that it does, it just it just interferes with that. Okay, so uh, so yeah, so I don't know. I wouldn't go around telling people that it's less dangerous than uh, alcohol or anything like that. What I would go around telling people is that it's a vice. Uh, it is not. I mean, like, I don't I don't know what to say. All all vices are kind of like they're not they're like not good for you. I mean, like gambling is not really good for you, and like drinking too much is not really good for you. Smoking pot's not really good for you. You really you really shouldn't um, encourage people to do these things, but uh, but but you know people will do these things. So that's uh, that's how it is. Anyway, though, so that's uh, that's where we are probably with the with the uh, stuff, the legal stuff. They really they're they're legalizing pot, and they really still know basically nothing about it. Um, they don't even really know how it's farmed, and so they're getting into all these debates and stuff is coming up. They're having problems where if you buy brownies now, like pot brownies from places where they're legal, then there's no way of knowing how much pot is actually in the brownie. Because they tell you how much pot is in the brownie per serving, but you have no freaking clue how much a serving is, or it's really hard to discern. So they're getting into this, where they're trying to just figure out how to regulate it, and they don't want to do things like, uh, like imagine that you bought like cannabis oil, and like they had there's like different brands of cannabis oil, and they all have completely different concentrations of, of THC in them. How would you know, like how much you're buying? And even then, like injections, like once you start getting into like hardcore injections, then I think you're probably smoking too much pot. Uh, so, yes, that's like that's like. If you think about that, that's like if you were drinking so much that you weren't getting enough of a kick and you had to start like directly injecting alcohol into your veins. <laughs> maybe, maybe just, maybe just cut back a little bit. You've got a, a, a too bad of a habit at that point. Um, so it's hard to say. They might. I mean, like, what I suspect they'll do is they'll probably uh, they're they're accepting consumables and smoking. 
they'll probably be a bit harsher on stuff like cannabis oil because it's much stronger, more potent. Um, and over time, I don't expect them to actually know what pot does to you over the long term. For another, like I say, 20 years would be about like, that's like watching, well, 10, maybe 10, 20 years uh, after they legalize it enough. Then they'll sort of know what it does to your body long term. But this is where we're at with it presently. Uh, it's money first, cents later, and that's just how it operates in politics sometimes. But uh, yes, so I, I hope that was uh, I hope that was good. Hope that was interesting. I suppose I will catch you guys later.